right, that's a tough act to follow. You know, it's always challenging when you're the uh, boring nonprofit guy that comes up after the astronaut show video. So, first thing, my name is Ken Shields. I'm director of flight operations and education initiatives at CASIS. Uh, CASIS is the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. Uh, give a little bit of background. First thing I want to do. Who's having a great time at the festival? Great festival. Woo! A lot of stuff going on. A lot of choices. A lot of options, a lot of stuff to learn. So really thankful and appreciative that you folks took out the time to come and visit with us and learn a little bit about cases and learn a little bit about what it's like to be an astronaut. A little background on our organization. Cases, as I said, is the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. We're the nonprofit organization that manages the International Space Station National Laboratory. Um, kind of a three-pronged stool you might think of. Uh, our job is to promote science discovery on station technology development on station, and also education. And not necessarily in that order. Education is, is vital to everything that we do, and it's at the core of everything that we do, and it's why all you kids and your parents and your teachers and educators are here today. Um, at, at CASIS, we feel like we have a, a very unique opportunity to utilize a, a classroom in space and a learning platform that can't be duplicated anywhere else. Uh, when you think of space, you think of, you know, it's extraterrestrial, it's almost not real. science and technology and engineering and mathematics is very scholarly. But we think we have a platform that also makes it very fun and adventurous. And, and that's what we try to do with our case of education programs. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Colonel Greg Johnson. Uh, Colonel Johnson, Greg Johnson, he is our executive director at Cases, uh, retired Air Force Colonel. I hate to say retired because he's a pretty young guy. He's older than me. Um, You're 50. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Okay. Don't bury me yet. Greg came on board with CASIS uh, out of the Astronaut Corps as an executive director. Uh, been with us about six months, uh, and it's really been a, uh, a great experience for me to get to know Greg. He's, he's been a great addition to our organization. Uh, he's really been a spark that's, that's lit the fire at CASIS. So without further ado, you're here to see Greg. Greg Johnson. <laughs> One of the great things about this job um, is this is my first non-government job. Um, this this nonprofit was formed um, just under three years ago, and uh, managing the science on the space station is a real honor. Working with guys like Ken and Austin back here, who's working really hard, and Brian over here, and Serge. I saw you. Are there any other cases, folks, running around? <laughs> Ken's wife family. Anyway, okay, so I guess what I'd like to start uh, by doing, and you can start the video now, is we as a nation, over 10 years ago, about almost 15 years ago, we started building the International Space Station. And has anybody seen the space station at night? I mean, that is something that you can see with your naked eye. I mean, you can see it just after sunset or prior to sunrise. You put your, your uh, zip code into uh, www.nasa.gov, the ISS overflight, and you'll be able to see it. This beautiful space station, we've flown 36 missions to assemble the space station, uh, plus additional logistical flights, so 40-ish uh, uh, space shuttle flights over about a 12-year time frame, putting together uh, the International Space Station. In the background, you can see uh, some just clips from my uh, last shuttle flight. I have two shuttle flights. One in 2008 and uh, in 2011, and this was the final assembly flight of the International Space Station. So, you know, deep in my heart, I've been working uh, with NASA um, for a couple decades almost, uh, helping to build the International Space Station. You can see this beautiful facility behind us. But now the U.S. taxpayer needs to use the space station. Um, NASA is going to the moon and to Mars and to a near-Earth asteroid. Na NASA is all about going up and out, but the space station was also uh, built to help us here on the planet for the down and in. And so this beautiful facility, a uh, zero gravity facility, we can learn things that we can't learn anywhere else on the planet because you can't turn the, the gravity vector off, the light switch 
I'm blocking your way, I'm sorry, the internet uh, of, uh, of gravity. So we've invested these shuttle flights to build the International Space Station, the shuttle's retired, but we've got six astronauts and cosmonauts up in space right now doing research. And so the sto our story today is, we're talking about the International Space Station, we're talking about the, the wonderful things that we're hoping to learn over the next decade, because the space station is now at least going out to 2024. And the future space explorers, you individuals, you young people out in the audience, you're the ones that are gonna make a difference um, uh, on the International Space Station. So today we're gonna talk about CASIS Academy. Now CASIS, we put science on the space station, we put technology on the space station, and as Ken said, one of our missions, and it came directly from Congress, was for us to um, motivate the next generation of explorers, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. So we've got the CASES Academy and lots of different resources, uh, teachers that we sponsor, um, programs that we sponsor, and this event, for example, uh, all about understanding what the opportunities are out there in science, technology, engineering, and math. So the International Space Station, and right here you can see a, 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 a small version of the space station, and, and, and we selected this one because we're, we were building the space station, just like you, ch you young people are building your minds and building your aspirations to do great things in the world. And here we see the International Space Station, the laboratory right there is the Destiny Laboratory. You can see the astronauts looking out the window at our beautiful planet. Now when I first went up to the International Space Station, uh, the cupola wasn't there. And if you don't know what the cupola is, that's okay. It's like a big bay window that looks at our planet. But the second time I was up there and I realized how important it is for us to look at our planet, and that's one of the important things that we do on the space station, is observe our planet from 250 miles up. And we can learn things about our planet that we can't on Earth. Just like this huge convention center we have, we can't really appreciate how, how big it is and what it really is when we're in it. But when you're outside of the convention center and you look at it, there's something different about it that you couldn't experience when you were in, 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 in the convention center. And the space station is like that. So looking through these beautiful windows that we have on the space station and recording using different sensors, hyperspectral sensors, audio, video, there's so many things we can learn about our planet on the International Space Station. So here's some statistics about the International Space Station that I said. Uh, we started building it back in 1999, so it's been almost 15 years, but it was completed three years ago. Um, lots of missions to assemble it. We invested uh, many, many shuttle flights, many countries involved with the International Space Station. And you know, even the difficulties that we have in Russia, we're not having difficulties with the Russians on the International Space Station right now. So our cooperation on the International Space Station transcends the, the, the uh, conflicts that we have. And our relationship with Russia has been that way for decades. And so right now the ISS, the International Space Station, is, is uh, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And that's a good reason why it would win the Nobel Peace Prize, because it's cooperation. And you were here earlier and you saw the slide deck that was kind of um, nicely animated by Austin. Uh, you might have seen a picture of Mark Kelly, you might have recognized him, and there was a Russian next to him. And his, he, his, his name is Dmitry, and he was a MiG-29 pilot. And when I went up on my last shuttle flight, um, we worked together for about half the mission. He actually left halfway through the mission, which was a little bit unusual. I was an F-15 pilot. He was a MiG-29 pilot. We were direct enemies in our, our respective air forces, but now we are up on the International Space Station working together. So the inter international cooperation of the International Space Station is, uh, is profound. Um, some other statistics about the space station, it's larger than a football field. That's why you can see it from the ground at night. 17,000, it has like two, 240, I always say 17,500 miles an hour zipping across the sky, you can see it, and it's like the brightest star in the sky, and it's going faster than um, uh, maybe than an airliner might have, you'd imagine an airliner flying, although it's 250 miles up, it's not 50,000 feet up. So anyway, space station, an amazing facility. This is the crew that's up there right now. And if you look at this crew, we can see the international flavor of this crew. You've got uh, 
one of my favorite guys, Koichi, right here. He's a Japanese. He is the first Japanese astronaut to ever command the International Space Station. So he's up there right now working hard. And here's Swanee, he's my classmate, and Rick Mastrocchio. And look at these guys, these are all Russian cosmonauts, all working up on the International Space Station. So, those on the space station, I always say there's two different kinds of astronauts. There's the pilots, and there's the smart ones. <laughs> and, I, and I was a pilot, okay. But now, almost 50, like Ken. I'm just kidding, where is Ken? I lost him. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, uh, but uh, you all are gonna be the ones that are gonna get to go up in space, and so science is the, one of the great things that we do on the International Space Station. And you're all scientists, you just don't know it. I mean, are you curious? Do you observe the world around you? You know, one of the interesting things about the space station is when we take gravity out of the equation, you turn the gravity switch off, so there is no gravity. I mean, just imagine that. No gravity, you're floating out of your seat, you're bumping into each other. Those of you that are against that wall, you're not gonna be able to grab off on anything, so you're gonna bounce off the wall, bounce off your buddy, okay. But there's something interesting to observe in, in outer space, and that is that things change. Protein crystals, for example, when they're grown on the planet, they're pulled by the force of one gravity. That's like 200 pounds going through my feet. I was a little lighter, but no. But, uh, but anyway, so you have a protein crystal that gravity is pulling on, but when you take gravity out of the equation, you can observe a different, perfect, larger protein crystal. And you can map a drug, a pharmaceutical drug, to that protein crystal, and that, maybe that protein crystal is like the Huntington crystal that causes Huntington's disease. And you can map a drug against that crystal more perfectly and cure a disease. We just launched, just a week ago, launched a, an experiment that is hoping to cure Huntington's disease by building larger crystals. And by observing those in zero gravity, our scientists are learning things. We ask lots of questions, and in cases we don't have the answers. And we're searching all over the country, and eventually all over the world for these folks that have the answers. And some of them have the answers and they don't even know it. And maybe some of you, young future explorers, are gonna have the answers for us. None of you guys like iPhones, do you? Yeah, Mike? Oh, you do? Oh, are you holding up your iPhone? Okay. <laughs> yeah, my son always, he, he always, uh, he's, a, he's a, Mac, uh, a Mac snob, I say. Because I have a PC, I, you know, I, I can't learn the Mac thing, but he's a Mac guy. He's an iPhone guy, and if I ever have any problems with my iPhone, I ask my son. Helping others. Sci scientists do all of these things. It's not just about wearing a white lab coat and working uh, in, a, in a boring laboratory. And you're always on a team. We've got leaders, but we've got followers. And we're pe we all have a mission to, to solve problems in space. So, so why are we up there? I've talked a little bit about why we're up there, but you know, we're building better products. My parents, when they were alive, and they, and they passed away over a decade ago now, they had no idea what an iPhone would be like, or what you could have a GPS that you put it in your car, you don't even have to look at a map, and it'll tell you where to go. And sometimes it'll take you around DuPont Circle, and you'll never find your way. <laughs> building new, uh, building, uh, making new materials. Uh, when I was in Germany, uh, a couple years ago, a, a, a gentleman from Airbus held up a, a jet turbine, and he, he wanted me to hold it. And I said, oh, that's pretty cool. And then he handed me another jet turbine, and it was about half the weight. It looked just the same, it was about half the weight. He said, we learned how to make this turbine. It, it's got all the material properties this jet turbine blade has, except it weighs half as much. Can you imagine the engineering benefit of that? Now the problem was, it takes 10 times as much money to make the lighter weight one than the heavier one. So, so they can't commercialize that, 
but the technology of learning how the material, the, in this case it was um, material crystals that were growing in zero gravity, they understood the material by growing these large crystals in micro G, and they were able to make, learn from that and then build these turbine blades on the ground. If they can figure out how to do that at one third the cost, then it will revolutionize the jet engine uh, industry. I talked a little bit about how medicines and medicines map to the protein crystal more perfectly, and then you can dial down the dosage. So instead of having like 40 milligrams of Lipitor for those folks with high cholesterol, maybe one milligram of Lipitor X that matches your genome, no side effects, no liver damage. And of course that improves health. <laughs> oh, what, what's, what, what am I missing? Okay. Oh, <laughs> words. Okay, so here's a picture of the cupola, and uh, the cupola is the bay window I talked about, and we have a robotic uh, uh, arm that is operated in the cupola, so I spent, logged a lot of time inside the cupola looking at our planet. And the one thing, the largest thing that occurred to me is how beautiful this planet is when you're actually not on it. I can't imagine how beautiful the Earth must, must have looked to Alan Bean when he looked, he's one of the moonwalkers. He was actually the fourth moonwalker. Um, and I actually saw him last month. He's now an artist. He came back from the moon and he became an artist because he was so moved by the beauty of our planet. So as I said, we've got a unique view down to the earth. But we also can study the harsh environment, the heat, the cold, the radiation, the vacuum. That's up on the International Space Station. So in, in addition to uh, science, we also can better understand for satellites, for example, what it's like for sensors or other things that could be on a satellite uh, in this harsh environment of uh, space. Microgravity, obviously, um, I've talked a little bit about that, but when gravity's not pulling on a crystal, you can see those beautiful, perfect crystals. So to, to wrap this thing up, uh, what are we doing down here? Well, we're having a symposium like this. We're talking to children, we're talking to parents, we're talking to teachers, and one of the ways that we interface is through our Cases Academy website. The Cases Academy website is fun. I've messed around with it, and we've got lots of ap applications that you can learn all about space. It'll open up the world of, of, of learning uh, with respect to cases. Here's some of the kids that have uh, uh, done some exciting things on the, on the Cases Academy website. And uh, we're really looking forward to you being motivated. You know, it's all about dreaming. Uh, anybody out here when I was seven years, when they were seven years old? Or is there anybody out there that's seven years old? Raise your hand. Seven year olds, seven year olds. You're seven? Anybody else? You're seven? I'm nine. Well, if you, oh, you're nine? Okay, well then, no. <laughs> seven? All right. Well, when I was seven years old, and if you've done the math, you might have think, think this through here. I'm 51. When I was seven, it was when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, and he was my number one inspiration. And I walked outside of my grandparents' house in Michigan, and I looked up at the moon, and there was a guy walking on the moon. It was really moving to me. And I never, I dreamed of being an astronaut, but I never thought I'd get to be one. I worked on it for like 40 years, finally figured out how to be an astronaut. So you can do it. It takes hard work, though, but it takes having your eye on the ball. You've got to be focused on what you love. And it doesn't have to be flying jets because we have hosts of astronauts that are doctors, that are teachers. The first teacher in space was one of my classmates, Barb Morgan. So anything you want to do, the sky's the limit. We have a wonderful country. Our opportunities are not limited by our, by our gender, by our race, even by our political standing, um, social standing. It's all about you doing what you believe in and what you want, want to do. And so that's why we're here today to talk about inspiration, science, technology, engineering, and math. And these kids have uh, enjoyed uh, interfacing with our website on uh, Cases Academy. So with that, I will answer any questions about education, about space, or whatever you want. So we've got about, uh, I guess, what, about 10 minutes or so, Austin, 15 minutes? Any questions? Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Um, because when you went up in space, didn't you? You went up in space, right? Uh, 
Okay, the question was, what did we eat, eat up in outer space? Well, food, food. <laughs> now, in the day, they ate these little toothpaste tubes of food, it was really gross. Our food was pretty, pretty good. Uh, we have dehydrated food. Anybody can guess why we had dehydrated food? Yeah, why? Um, maybe because you're up there for Okay, so keeping the food fresh, that's a very good point, because being up there, it's teamwork. It's like being on a camp out. I mean, really, when you're on the International Space Station, it's like being, being on a camp out. And so keeping fruit fresh, that's a, an important point. It's also lighter weight when you add the water to the food afterwards. Now, on the International Space Station, that's not so beneficial, because we have to pick the water up there, too. So, you know, they don't have, uh, they don't have plumbing or anything, you know, but, to, so, so the International Space Station, uh, the visiting vehicles that go to and from the space station have to bring water. The space shuttle had unlimited water because we made our electricity by mixing hydrogen and oxygen and the byproduct was water. So we had unlimited water. So we gave them all our water and we stole all their electricity. Well now the space station, they have lots of electricity but they, they need water. So, uh, so the, a lot of the food they have up there is not dehydrated but but it does keep it fresh, so that's another reason that some of it does. Uh, we also have canned food, um, so the Russians really love to do that, and they love to use magnets on the Russian side of the International Space Station. We like to use Velcro and bungee cords, so you know, just a little different way to skin the cat, but it does the job. Um, also, M&Ms are really cool because they fly at zero gravity. Have you ever tossed an M&M into your into your parents' mouth or? Yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of fun to do. But in space, it's really fun because you throw it and it goes in a straight line. And another funny thing is all the shuttle astronauts, we all had our own color. The commander was red, the pilot was yellow, so I was always the yellow guy. And so the M&Ms, I would pick out the color of the M&Ms and toss them into the respective mouths of the astronauts as we ate meals. So that was one of the thing, things that I uh, kind of entertained my crew uh, was when I was out in space. All right, next question over here. Yes. Question was, what, what were my feelings at the beginning of my first mission? Well, I, I'm gonna start it with, with a little bit of a negative tone, which I normally try not to do. But when my kids were, let's see, they were about six, nine, and 10, um, a little over 10 years ago, we had a shuttle accident. And it was before my first flight. And my kids and my wife and I were watching TV and we watched it on the news as we lost a space shuttle. And some of you kids out there are old enough to maybe remember that. I know your parents are. No, it was, it was Columbia. I mean, Challenger happened back when I was in college, but, um, but, Ch uh, but Columbia happened when I was an astronaut, but not, yet not assigned to my first flight yet. So you can imagine how my kids felt, okay? They're, and my wife and my whole family, they're very concerned but they knew that this is something that I wanted to do. And we worked for years to make it safer and safer. So I believed in, 19, or in 2008, which was about five years later, I believed that we had done as much as we could do to make the space shuttle as safe as we could. But I also knew that it was pretty risky. So I was a little bit intimidated. Um, I'd been training for almost 10 years. And so this is, this is something that I was ready to go do. Um, I had, a I had a feeling of unknown, though, a little bit. I was a fighter pilot, I told you, and I went to the Persian Gulf War, and my first combat mission, when I was gonna go fly into Iraq, um, I had that same feeling. I was like, oh, I just don't know what's on the other side. And so I had some of that fear. But I also had, um, I had confidence, because I've been training for almost 10 years. I mean, how long do you have to train to be confident as a pilot in the space shuttle, you know what I'm saying? So I was confident but I was intimidated, but I think my family was really intimidated, so it was a mix of emotions. But as soon as those solids lit, as soon as those solid rocket boosters lit and the thing leaped off the ground, um, I was focused. So I went from being a little intimidated to focused, but I also knew I was going somewhere. Has anybody gotten in a huge car wreck before? A huge car wreck. Okay. Now, 
Had you ever been in a car wreck prior to that? Not really. Have you learned about car wrecks from other people? Okay, now when you got your first huge car wreck, were you really surprised what it felt like? Yeah, it's something that you just don't, didn't know. And so that's what it was like. We jumped off the ground and said, woo, I'm going somewhere. And, uh, and then off we went, eight and a half minutes later, we're in space going 17,500 miles an hour. So that was kind of the launch experience. Light, sound, vibration, excitement. Yeah, it was everything. It was wild. Yes, ma'am. Oh, over here. Yes. How did we exercise? Well, that's a good question. You know, a lot of the basic things we do here on the planet are we use one, one gravity. It holds us down. So if you're on a treadmill, right, you can imagine if you turn the gra gravity switch off, what happens? You start floating up into the air. So we have things that hold us down to a treadmill. Um, we had a bicycle up there, and we had shoes that locked into the bicycle um, uh, pedals so that you could paddle. Weight lifting. Uh, how much weight do you think you can lift in space? Okay, now, heavy, heavy weights, like we had these big water bags that weighed 600 pounds, and you could move those things. But you get that thing going, it's pulling you all the way through the space station. It's got a lot of inertia. You know, so you can't get it moving real fast, but you know, if you put forces on it increasingly, um, you know, you'll get moving, and then, and then you'll crash into something you know, with a water bag. I've, I've done that before. I actually took off a whole wall of, uh, of Russian camera lenses one time, because they have tiny little Velcro, they hold these big lenses, you know, because it's zero gravity, you just don't need much force to hold it there. I kind of fold out a bunch of lenses. Anyway, that was just a story. Um, but we've got resistive equipment, kind of like Bowflex. I don't know, but maybe I'm dating myself, but it's, uh, it's uh, bands and bungee kind of things and cylinders that have resistance so that we can mimic the force of gravity. Yes? Okay, the question, very good question. Where are you from? I'm yes, I know, I know. The last I wanted you to tell for everybody. Yes. Yes. Well, Kate, and, and, and what's, the, the, the issue here is that, that CASIS was formed by the U.S. government, by the U.S. Congress, to benefit us here on the planet. And so, uh, but, but to, ben to benefit, I'm sorry, here, us here on the planet, but in the U.S. part of the planet. Because we're the ones, you know, that we're, we're talking about the investment that we made as, as a country. But CASIS, I believe CASIS will expand. Um, right now it's CASIS USA. I think it's going to be... Cases Europe, cases Japan, cases Earth, um, because all of us serve, and, and the Europeans and the Japanese and the Russians and, and the Brazilians, they invested their money too. And so they're probably going to have the equivalent of a cases. And it may not be us, but it's going to be something like us, where we're promoting the benefits of the space station for the, for the planet instead of trying to use it as a springboard to go somewhere else. Okay, over here. Yes, what sir. was your educational background, undergrad? Graduate the question was, what was my, uh, uh, my educational background? I went to the Air Force Academy, uh, and then right after the academy, I went to Columbia University uh, in New York to get my master's in engineering. So I was a trained engineer, but then I started flying airplanes, and I kind of got the bug. But I ended up going to test pilot school, which kind of brought the engineering part back into my world. Um, and then... After the Columbia accident, I went and got my business degree. Because honestly, after the Columbia accident, I wasn't 100% positive that I was going to um, get even one shuttle flight. So I, as I, I knew I wanted to go into business someday, so I got my business, so I MBA uh, during that period of time. So I've got a couple degrees. Yes? Question is, where did we land? That's a very good question. We uh, launched all the shuttles from Ken the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And we, in general, we landed at that same spot. It's a big, long runway, about 15,000 feet long. But we had other runways on uh, the continental United States that we landed on. 
Uh, in particular, there's one in Edwards Air Force Base, California, that we would occasionally land on. Um, because the weather in Florida is terrible, and the weather in Edwards, California is always really good. So when, weather, when the weather was bad in Florida, we had landed at, in uh, California. But we also had another landing site in uh, New Mexico. Uh, so, and as a matter of fact, the space shuttle could land anywhere around the world. We trained to land anywhere where the runway is long enough, but we didn't want to, for example, have to land there and then figure out how to get our shuttle back. Uh, yes? Oh, that's a great question. He asked, how, how did we keep uh, in contact with our families? And that's really one of my favorite stories. Um, I remember, remember that cupola that I was showing the bay window that we looked at the planet? Well, I was sitting in that thing with a laptop on my second flight and a video teleconference with my wife and three kids. And they were on the ground and I was in the cupola. And we started over Michigan and we were going 17,500 miles an hour. So we were zipping so I was talking to them, you know, and they were telling me the stories. Rachel was talking about his dance, Joseph was talking about his trumpet, you know, his grades. And then I said, oh, here comes New York City. And I turned the laptop around and they saw out the cupola of New York. And then through that 20 minute conversation, we went from Michigan to New York. We buzzed London, England, because that's where I was born. I said, hey, I was born over there. And then we were talking more, and then we went over the Med, then we went over the Sahara Desert, and we ended over um, Madagascar in that 20-minute call. So they're mad at me because I'm gone all the time. My daughter, actually, I was in Houston. My daughter had a big dance thing, and so I went back for that. But um, uh, I haven't been with my kids as much as I want to, but I'll tell you what, having a laptop and sharing that with them made up for some of that. You know? Also, my son had a birthday, his, his 18th birthday, when I was in space last time. Uh, and it, it occurred to me that his birthday was like 48 hours long because I was going around the earth every 90 minutes, right? And so I hit a time zone. It was way in advance of his birthday. I actually called him, and it wasn't his birthday yet. I called him on the phone because we had this IP phone. We talked on the phone quite a bit. And I said, happy birthday. He says, Dad, I haven't gone to bed yet. It's the 18th. <laughs> okay, sorry. All right. I'll call you back. And then I realized that it was still his birthday in some parts of the world well past what his birthday it really was in Houston, so funny little thing. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. Yes. Question was, what was my favorite part of space? Um, I think the zero gravity thing. It's it's like it's like Alice in Wonderland. I, I don't know if you've read that book, but you walk, you know, Alice walked through the Looking Glass and was in this world where Cheshire Cat was in the you know in the tree, and all these things were different than how they are outside on the other side of the Looking Glass. And everything was so different in space, even now it's like a dream. So anyway, um, over here. Uh, no, we already got you, I'm sorry. There's a question over here. Sorry. How do you sleep and where? How do you sleep? That's a great question. It's really comfortable. So um, when you fall asleep, has your arm ever like fallen asleep on you or you got uncomfortable or something? In space, there's no forces on your body, so it's like beautiful. It'd be a great retirement community. But. Um, <laughs> But anyway, I'm a roller. I like to roll in my bed to get myself back to sleep, and so I lost out on that, so I didn't sleep very well. Now, we, we zip ourselves in these hammocks, like thing. it's like a sleeping bag with like four corners that have Velcro and they have a little hook, and you can put them anywhere. Um, I like to put mine against the floor so that um, I had something up against my body because I felt like I was against something. Um, but, uh, but you can also just float in just complete suspension. It's crazy. It's weird. Um, last question. I'm sorry. We're, I think we're going to have a little interaction outside after this, but um, yes, ma'am. Uh, the question was, what's it like flying in zero gravity? And I was explaining this to Ken Shields. Um, there he is, uh, about flying in zero gravity. Were you here when the movie was playing? Okay, that was my first shuttle flight. And I put the camera up at the end of the... Um, of the module there, and we all were diving. And what the difficulty with diving is that you can go up, right, or this way, right? So you can go X, Y, Z, all right? But you can also do pitch, yaw, roll. So there's like six different ways your body can get messed up. Now, in, here on the planet, gravity just holds us here, so you can just go in one direction, and you're just fine. 
but in space, and we don't like rotate, we're not tilting around you know, as, we, as we navigate here on the planet. But in zero gravity, it's really hard to get pure x and then zero up the y, the z, the PGR roll. So as we were diving, you could see like somebody would go like this, or their body go like this, because you have no control over it. So it was fun. I mean, it was just so much fun. And your hair, it would be floating up like a lion. OK, well, that's all the time we've got. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we'll turn this over to Ken. Um, That uh, hair reference doesn't work for anybody. <laughs> Pick another analogy. Okay, no, no, no. I gotta tell a funny story. <laughs> no, no, no. This, Mark, Mark Kelly. I don't know if you all know Mark Kelly. He was the commander of my second shuttle flight, and and he cuts his hair real short like you do. You're not bald. You just cut it short. That's what that's. And and so, but anyway, Katie Coleman, she had a pretty good head of hair, and it would float up. It's Big, beautiful hair, and like a lion. It really didn't look like a lion. And I do have a photograph that I don't show in public, but we floated Katie behind Mark Kelly. <laughs> her, hair, her hair was like that, so I, I have a picture like that, but he told me, he pointed his finger and said, do not show that in public. So I wanted to, but he looks like kind of a rock star with his hair, you know, because. <laughs> <laughs> He's just jealous. <laughs> All right, here it is, the uh, nonprofit guy following the astronauts. I don't know why I'm using this gig, but. Um, we're gonna line up. Greg's gonna take a couple minutes break. Uh, while he's doing that, we're gonna get organized. If you're interested, um, and you should be, we're gonna go outside and get organized and lined up, and Greg's gonna provide us with an opportunity where he can spend a, a minute or two with you and, and talk with you and, and sign uh, one of his astronaut photographs. Um, so. Want to get ready for that? Okay. Uh, while, while he's getting ready, does anybody have any more questions about the ISS or any non astronaut related questions? Do <laughs> you like to make up an answer if it's astronaut related? Yes. Um, I know that you talked about how work. Yeah, I think so. Um, two good questions, and I'll repeat them to make sure I get them right. You were, you were questioning maybe what is some of the fundamental scientific research on molecules or cell structures or something like that right. that's being conducted on the station? Yes. And secondly, you work with wounded warriors, and are there any sort of maybe applied science investigations right. that go on that might help something like that? Yes. Was I close? Okay. Very close. Um, yeah, some of the fundamental science we do, let me see if I can think of a good example. Um, yeah, we have a major uh, pharmaceutical company that is uh, flying an investigation, and they are looking at uh, the protein structures of monoclonal antibodies. And they're trying to grow these protein structures in space because there are some proteins that are very, very difficult to grow in the presence of gravity uh, because of the effects of gravity. Um, in microgravity, they can grow the crystals larger. Uh, they can grow with increased mosaicity, so that then they can properly x-ray diffract them and then learn how to better construct and design um, drugs that will bond to these proteins that might affect uh, the diseases or the uh, um, ailments that these proteins are the fundamental building blocks. The proteins are the fundamental building blocks of all living things. So when you break it down to the protein structure, you are really breaking it down to the most fundamental essence as far as how it's built. That's an example of some of the uh, cell structures in the microgravity environment uh, to try and develop better um, vaccines for salmonella. And they made a lot of progress there. Uh, what, what we found is salmonella, uh, really a lot of viruses in microgravity are much more virulent. They grow differently, much more rapidly. So we learn things about them, how they grow, and we are able to determine, um, once again, some of those fundamental causes so that we can figure out ways to uh, with respect to your other question, we actually have selected and funded a company uh, out of Massachusetts called Benevolent Technologies. 
and they are looking at um, different ways to where a prosthetic arm or leg or prosthetic limb meets with a joint. Mm -hmm. They're trying to develop a better material to make that a stronger joint and also more comfortable. So they're looking at the settling properties and the different uh, mixing components of what those properties are to improve that, to improve where that prosthetic limb uh, is. Answer your question? Thank you. Any others? Okay, good. We can, uh, did you have a question back here? No? Okay. We can go out. We're going to, oh, wait, we got one more question from the future astronaut. With the astronauts? That's a great question. You know what? There's a there's a few different ways we can communicate. We can communicate uh, via radio. Um, there is uh, Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. This is where they control mission operations. Um, payload operations, actually. Mission operations are controlled out of Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And they're in constant communication with the astronauts. There's a room not much bigger than this one huge TVs, I mean, it's like a sports bar on steroids, where they are watching what the astronauts are doing all the time, and there's always probably about a dozen people in the room at Johnson Space Center who are on console, who are in constant communication. There's also email up and down. There are laptops on the International Space Station. Sometimes the astronauts bring their iPads with them. So there are different ways we can communicate. There's even an education program where students can communicate with the astronauts via ham radio. So you can propose to NASA some good reason why you think you need to talk to the astronauts. You might wait, you might get a customer seat. Any other questions? All right, while, while we're getting lined up and while we're waiting in line, because nobody likes to wait in line, it's going down about this close. We're gonna have a uh, raffle, so we're gonna pass out some tickets while you're in line, give away some cool stuff, maybe some signed posters, t-shirts, whatever else we can find. All right, thanks, thanks for coming out, let's get in line.